Shadow. As the preparation of the army still takes a long time, I took Jet and traveled to Altdorf again, mostly because this was where the wizards had their center. Not so much the Amber Order, as they disdain living in a city of any kind, but the others. The Emperor was glad to ride a dragon again, and present his imperial dragon as a symbol of power and authority. And then we hid in his study for more wine and plotting. Already got half the colors of magic? Well, I can perhaps help with the Grey Order. They often work for me as diplomats. Or killers. Wilhelm whispered in a secretive voice. Was this a big secret? Everyone knew the Shadowmancers worked in the shadows. He took out a magical device from his desk and tapped a few brass keys. A minute later, a statue beside the door gained a new shadow, and a young man in a gray cloak emerged mysteriously. Emmanuel, this is P.E.F. The emperor said in a mild voice. The warden of the east. The dragon tamer. And the giant club in your right hand, your majesty, the young wizard declared in a creepy whisper. Did they train to speak like that? Most likely. There is a need for a young female wizard of your order to join my warden's retinue in Waldenhof. Possibly for her entire life. Wilhelm proposed in the same mild voice. It was fascinating to see soft power at work. The emperor could tug a few strings, and a head would fall a thousand miles away. The wizard stood still for a long minute, likely considering candidates and skills. There is no wizard like that and available here in Altdorf. But I do have an apprentice close to gaining her journeyman rank. If the mighty warden thinks he can avoid deploying Emmanuel on dangerous missions for a few years, until she becomes strong enough. I nodded gratefully. Young wizards were rare. But a strong apprentice would be enough. I had my ways to make her stronger. Also, I would request you investigate the Skaven Citadel under this city. Their gray seers are dangerous, so don't go too deep. Just pinpoint entrances and connections with the criminals that trade with the rats. I'll deal with the massacre when it's time. I said in a level voice, and patted the unbreakable club on my hip. As my warden says, Grey Wizard. Reports from Marienburg and Nuln have confirmed the rats were infiltrating my empire for decades. Wilhelm added in a sad voice. The man nodded and jumped into a nearby shadow, his spell quite reminiscent of the Grey Seer I had killed in Zufbar but far less speedy. So, I heard you visited Norska recently, the emperor continued in the same collected voice. Only the shores and only a few ports. Destroyed a few chaos temples as well. But they won't give up. I answered with a casual shrug. The emperor just sighed, sounding old and tired suddenly. Of course, medieval people rarely reached fifty years old. And emperors likely never did. The imperial court was just as dangerous as any battlefield in Sylvania. Any noble or courtier might plot to change the emperor, even without the warp plagues caused by the skaven underneath. You would be the perfect emperor, my warden. Immortal and invulnerable. Just like the dragons which rule Cathay or the emperor suggested in a delicate voice. Was he testing me? A perfect orc boss, you mean, your majesty. If strength was the only requirement to lead a human country, we wouldn't need laws and roads. I think those old dragons are far smarter or wiser than me. Even so, my strength will always be available when the empire of man is in danger. The big club behind the throne. I offered with a sad voice, then flew towards the window. I hope so. The emperor said in a low tone, then coughed into a towel, leaving a globe of green slime on it. I landed beside Jet, who gazed upon the Imperial Zoo from the castle's rampart. Miss the old place? Not really. Just memories, some good, most bad. And there's a woman inside that wall my dragon pointed with his nose at a tower just behind me. You can come out, Emmanuel. Don't worry, Jet is quite friendly. I called out to the shade hidden inside a wall. Dressed like a musician, maybe a bard, even holding a lute on her back, the grey mage stepped through a shadow in front of us. I think my master already told you I am not that strong, Lord Warden. Emmanuel Nacht, at your service, the new companion introduced herself, with a decent bow and a bouncy chest nearly popping out of her bodice. 
Good enough, her disguise would deflect any suspicion of magic. Not that she had much magic anyway. Her control over Ulgu is quite shaky, Warden. But her glands will feed your children quite well. Jet spoke in my mind, sounding bored. Exactly my thoughts, dear Jet. Truly, having someone talking mind to mind was a great boon. Not only in battle, but also for other things. Now we only need the lore of heavens to start your training, little Jet. Or maybe a Tempest Maiden. I spoke in a low voice, while placing Emma on the dragon and flying up. I would have thought you were going to search for an amethyst wizard next, they use Shyish, right? Jet asked as we flew towards Nuln at Mach 10. They can read minds though. I will avoid that until I get stronger. I answered with a reluctant voice. I didn't mind their death spells nor their supposed association with necromancy. Any wind of magic had a few spells that neared the bad limit, simply because what their source was, the warp. But if I knew my lore right, any mage could technically use any other wind, or even all of them. Not easily or fluently, especially not if they learned magic in a certain system. But my own experiment with the Book of Nagash proved I could cast those spells just fine. I mean, barely at all. But the rest only took practice and probably affinity with Durr. Very likely, it would take decades of practice and a million spells casted just to get enough skill as the least necromancer, but it could be done. And plenty fallen wizards had done so. This was the probable reason why Teclas had formed the Colleges of Magic this way. Keep the wizards and their winds separated and in conflict, such that they wouldn't work together and reach my conclusion. Uniting the winds would bring back the high magic used by the elves and the old ones before them. Well, they will unite soon enough in my bed. Enchantment. Dragons are bullshit. Any human instinctively knows this, not only because dragons are big and powerful, but because they have magic. And dragon magic seems to work on whatever rules it wants. The dragon rulers of Cathay have actually raised their bastion wall going for thousands of kilometers with a single spell. Little Jet had a long way to go until he reached those magical heights, but in Nuln he proved his worth. I simply said, it's nothing bad if you fail, Jet. I will be a bit disappointed, and just hire a dozen dwarf smiths instead. I know, I was a bit unfair, but he would grow faster this way. Thus, the Imperial Dragon bypassed thousands of years of study and casted not only durability but also protection from fire enchantments on the new rifled cannons just finished by the engineers. Not exactly runes, but the draconic equivalent which worked just as well. And then, to amaze me even more, Jet enchanted the artillery shells with his dragonfire, or filled them with exploding napalm. One of these two. Emma was supposed to be a reserved and sneaky type, as a grey mage, but the test firing of the known cannons filled her heart with excitement anyways. Those straw targets exploded and burned like, desiccated undead, perhaps. Can you imagine what these big guns will do now, Lord Warden? A dozen of them would lay waste to entire armies from afar. And never get worn out either. She gushed with a gleam in the eye, and hugged me tight. Imagine that. And I just ordered one hundred such cannons for my army of the East. I noted in a wry voice. Emma blushed a little as my hands lifted her by her bouncy ass. We could celebrate at an inn, maybe with some wine, she proposed in a horny voice. And so we did. Her bouncy breasts bounced nicely in front of me as she rode me for a few hours. Bouncy Emma. I bought her a long robe to hide my wife's precious bounciness from unworthy eyes. The Empire will need thousands of cannons like this, especially the kind enchanted by a dragon. Thus I ordered 300 more cannons, 20 for each imperial province and 100 more for a second army. The South also suffered numerous incursions from goblins, orcs and other races, coming through mountain past or forgotten tunnels under the Grey Mountains. While I could pay an advance fee to start the new furnaces and hire more apprentices, I kinda lacked 300000 gold for the extra 3000 cannons. You could raid further away, Warden. The undead in Araby are very rich, entire pyramids filled with gold and gemstones. Magic items too. Emma proposed in a raspy voice, while hydrating herself to recover. That's an option, but not without risks. There are strong mages in those lands. Thousands of years old. 
plus they may strike back at human lands afterwards. I mused in a low tone. I may need to go there anyways, maybe find another book of Nagash or some amulets for magical protection. Hunt more pirates? There are numerous tiny islands and coves filled with treasure, and all kind of pirates from Araby corsairs to dark elves and undead ones from the vampire coast. Nobody will know, or mind, if you destroy such scum. My grey mage wife whispered in a secretive voice. Pirate treasure? That sounded quite good. And also make the imperial trade much safer. I should avoid killing human sailors though, unless I caught them in the act. Perhaps make a few examples of the more bloodthirsty ones, and reform the rest. As in, direct them to raid and plunder other races. From Nuln we flew to Mindelheim, where the Graf was supposed to grant me access to the local college of magic which taught battle underscore magic to poor mages without a wind. I was also a poor mage, and in need to learn more spells, since my teacher sucked and promoted me to a magister rank without teaching me much. And also, provide me magic books to teach a dragon how to become a great mage. It was not easy, Lord Warden. It seems the High Elf Teclas has imposed a number of rules for someone to become a battle wizard, and you would break most of them. You're also too old. Graf Toddbringer muttered in low voice, while admiring my imperial dragon and his rider. So, what it will take? I asked in casual tone. A runefang weapon. The Graf explained a bit hesitant. I mean, if I wasn't me, it would have been impossible. The rare and precious runic weapons were gifted by the dwarves in a limited number, only for the elector counts. And they couldn't give away their heirloom, even if they got mad and tried to. In fact, I carried such a runefang sword on my back, mostly because they could withstand 10% of my force without breaking, so I wouldn't need to keep replacing the great sword I carried for my martial look. I tended to forget about it and break it when moving a bit fast. I drew out my sword and showed it to the nice graph. I can spare this one. It's not a famous weapon, but still made of gromroll and holding a few runes. The man measured the great sword with a greedy face, then sighed. The high wizard will be extremely pleased. I smiled and flew away, heading for the top of the mountain where the wizards underscore and underscore alchemists underscore guild was built. Less than an hour later, I returned with a bag filled with magic manuals and a young and freckled celestial wind wizard. I thought magic wind users didn't bother to visit Middleheim, but it seems the Celestial Order was also involved with leading this institute of learning. Lady Janna was barely out of apprenticeship, but the promise of a personal runefang and teaching a whole lot of orphan children in the East convinced her somehow. But it was probably the High Wizard from the Gold Order being eager to grab my runic bribe, thus his unusual kindness with precious manuals and his assistant being given away. Hmm, hopefully my other wives won't mind two more wives. Ah, Anika will be upset again, won't she? Jinx. The flight from Middleheim to Essen should have taken a few hours, even at the low Mach 10 speed of my slow dragon. But every 10 minutes or so, we would need to descend and aid a caravan under attack, then a witch hunter fighting an ugly strigoi, then adventurers fighting beastmen in the great forest, more adventurers daring to search in the dead wood and fighting mutants, more trade caravans attacked by zombies and ghouls, a hedge wizard being chased by a huge boar, a slayer dwarf losing to a vampire lord, more caravans, some road wardens fighting forest goblins, and a dozen more encounters like that. And not a big loot pile either. I looked at Janna with a suspicious glance as we approached Essen and saw the town being besieged by orcs. Maybe the high wizard gave me this woman to get rid of a jinx. It is not me. I bring fortune to those in my party, the celestial wizard claimed as I drew out my big club. Never mind then. Orcs should have a lot of metal with them, being quite the enterprising looters and pillagers of this world. First thing, a pass around the walls to clear the ladders and give the garrison some support and rest. Then another pass, pasting the siege engine crews in the back such that my city wouldn't get burned to a crisp. And then, land in the middle of the orc army and begin my Aikido training in the earnest. The crazy weapons of the orcs with their spikes and unlikely shapes made the training more difficult, but also more rewarding. Especially since I made my purpose into only using the weapon of the enemy for their kill, and give the unbreakable some rest. That Strigoi had already nicked my club once more, although I shouldn't have smacked him in the face. Magic fangs, probably. It took me another hour, but in the end only the orc boss remained, 
some three meters tall and made of giant muscles. Human arrow, are ya, the orc asked with bad grammar, while hefting a huge axe, glowing with dwarf runes. Maybe his huge tusks made speaking harder? Where did you find that axe? I asked back in a calm voice. The skull crumper? Over at the Stunty Fortress in the Badlands. Past the Tsar boys. The orc explained with a vague direction towards Kislev. Worth taking a look, if more runefangs could be found in another fallen dwarf hold. Great, I'll go visit the place and look for treasure, but until then, I'll take this axe. I explained in a polite voice while moving forward. The orc boss reacted as expected, slicing at me with enough force to fell a dozen trees, only to find his wrist redirecting his axe at his own neck and losing his head. Taking the axe for myself, I sliced the air a bit, but no game menu popped out. Not every runic weapon was a legendary one. A gleam of light caught my eye, and I sliced the orc's ear off to reveal an amber-studded earring. Asterisk congratulations. You have obtained a relic earring, formerly called Yellow Eye of Gork. Grants plus 10 affinity to Gur. Grants plus 10% ward save. Adds plus 10% weapon strength. Okay, maybe Janet did bring me luck. I should take her with me on future raids. Jet had landed beside me to start eating dead orcs, since food was food. Word of advice, a dragon is a hungry beast. Do not attempt to raise one if you can't provide food. I shrugged then took the women in my arms and flew to Waldenhof at a better Mach 30 speed. Introduce the new wives, deposit the loot, pick up Alana and Rivia and fly back. These two wives had healing spells, quite useful for repairing the garrison to full health. Then fly back to my castle, and meet Anika before her blood froze to ice. My lovely wife. Did you miss me? I asked gently, and took her in my arms. Worse than a pig. Man pig. She called out to me in an angry voice. I kissed her neck and flew into the sky, before the entire castle heard her. Anika. I am but a single man. When chaos and Skaven and the undead descend on our world, millions of people will die. Maybe all of them. I need to have many children and grant them my magic. Maybe then, there's a chance. The ice maiden sighed and wrapped her hands around my neck. A well-meaning man-pig, she wondered in a rhetoric tone. I kept flying until we reached the wild guard base in Ostermark. There, hundreds of blonde kids and a hundred Norskan women were learning the woodcraft trade from my hunters. Norska had few woods. These are captives from Norska. The women will give me a lot of strong kids. The orphans will fight in my wild guard. But even so, we will probably lose and everyone will die. I said in a soft, sad voice. Anika turned towards me, eyes glowing with cold ice. Norskans! Do you know what they do, when raiding in Kislev, she growled in a hateful voice? I kinda do. I saw their work in Nordland and Osland. But these kids will grow up in the Wild Guard. When they are ready, you could lead them to raid Norska for women and more kids. Then Kurgan lands in the east of Kislev. I want to deny chaos an easy recruiting ground, see? I offered in a gentle voice. Anika nodded slowly, although her eyes were still brimming with cold ice. I see, husband. Your heart is even colder than mine. Frozen cold, as the great winter itself. I sighed inward, since the truth was quite hurtful. But what could I do? The Empire had few people, and the chaos would recruit the rest, especially those in Norska and Kurgan. Better my way, than the alternative. Anyways, after this Anika became more understanding, if also colder. Does it make sense? I wasn't good with women, so I don't know. In her belly, Elsa was growing too, hopefully to become a frozen princess to ally us with Kislev. Poor Kislev. As bad as local peasants had it in the empire, those under the Tsar and his adamants had it much worse. But since I was the Warden of the East, I mentally included Kislev under my protection too. Finish things in Sylvania, and then I could start on Kislev too. Magic Lessons The genial plan of training my dragon into a proper powerhouse is working. Lady Janet took her teacher role very seriously, and trains anyone from the Wild Guard with any kind of magic spark, 
while Jet keeps an eye out and gives awesome rights to the kids that manage to learn a new spell. Positive reinforcement seems to work just as well as getting hungry in the wild, so we're doing both. The healing spells need practice too, and I learned cure light wounds too. I can use it just fine on the kids even the bears, but not on myself or my imperial dragon. He resists my Neger spell without even noticing it. Thus, by beating up Jet and forcing him to heal himself, he gained the more powerful version called Cure Serious Wounds which was strong enough to heal even dragons. But when he casts the spell on me, it barely works at all, which is both good and bad. The good is obvious. Most spells also fail to reach me at all, with Gur as a particular exception. The bad thing though, should I ever get hurt badly, I would need an Amber Wizard to heal me, or a dragon much stronger than Jet. The next important spells are Detect Magic and Dispel Magic, for obvious reasons. My Detect Magic only works when close to Jet, but on the other hand, my Dispel Magic is both strong and wide enough to cover an entire battlefield. I can work with this. Should an enemy mage cast a curse or debuff on my army, I can cancel it with a single word. Also, I can remove my own spells, which is quite important if I need to cast Tall's Fury on someone, and they become berserkers howling for blood. Janna stepped beside me, and hugged me gently with one arm. My lord husband, this was the strongest dispel I have ever seen. It covered the entire forest for kilometers. I kissed her cheek, then nodded towards the dragon pretending to sleep. Jet has a great healing spell too. The celestial wizard just shrugged. Dragons should compare only with other dragons. And from what I've read, other dragons are a hundred times stronger, she said with a mild voice. I felt Jet's pain though the bond, as if someone had kicked him right in the ego. I smiled a bit sad. As proud as I was about my dragon pet, she was probably right. I haven't met another dragon yet, so you may be right. But Jet is our imperial dragon and still young. He will get better. I will get much better, Warden. Jet grunted in my mind, while observing hundreds of kids struggling with magic exercises. His magic sight or witch sight was something amazing too, allowing the dragon to sense things nobody else could. Like invisible shadowmancer sneaking around and spying on me. My left hand caressed the bottom of my wife and touched the divine dagger, cancelling everyone's spells including Emma's shroud of invisibility. Eh? I was found again. Emmanuel wondered as she walked towards me and hugged me from the other side. I see your magic reserves are full again. Jet, want to hunt my wife a little? I asked at random, guessing intent and fact just as Jet opened an eye. Can I use my dragon fire? he asked in a bored voice. If Emma was a full wizard, we may risk it, but she had a lot more training to do. Only on illusions and such. Don't cook my wife, I like them raw. I quipped and pointed to the side. Run, bouncy Emma. The imperial dragon wants to hunt. I urged my wife, who took off while casting shadows and illusions to mask her trail. Jet counted to ten, like any proper hide-and-seek player, then howled loudly announcing his hunt had begun. Emma was long gone, leaving only mists and all sorts of illusions behind, but a dragon was not easily fooled. He sped into the forest, hunting the grey apprentice for fun. Janna shivered for a second, as a jet of dragonfire burned a cloud of mist to reveal it was empty. Five minutes top, she guessed at the remaining time. People tended to underestimate dragons, for some reason. Jet could have found and neutralized Emma in two seconds, if moving at tenth speed. He was being quite the sportsman, chasing illusions and making a show of his dragonfire. She made a shadow steed and runs through the treetops. Jet explained as he flew up and then down again while pulsing with detect spells like a radar station. Clever of you Emma, but a shadow horse will drain your mana even faster. Maybe she had a new spell to try out today? Three minutes now. Janna predicted with her own magic. She couldn't predict me though. I sped away, grabbed Emma and returned to the camp in a single second. Jet kept chasing the illusion riding a shadow horse for another minute, then realized he had been fooled. Cheater. I only lost because you interfered, my dragon shouted in my mind, then sped back to the camp in two seconds. Next time, don't take so long, mighty dragon.
If this was a real enemy, they could have aid waiting for them, or a teleport circle prepared. I said in a disappointed voice, while entering my cabin and setting my wives on the bed. Oh, more husbandry again, dear husband? Jana guessed and started taking off her clothes with slow and calculated moves. Well, I was caught, now I have to deal with the consequences. Emma said while blushing slightly, and taking deep breaths to recover from the chase. I nodded seriously, and undressed as well. The new wives needed to be bound to me with chains of love and responsibility, thus plenty of lovemaking and setting them on important tasks. I took Jana in my lap, and kissed Emma deeply. Cast your pall of darkness, my grey wife. There are too many curious eyes on us right now. I proposed with a knowing voice. My cabin and everyone inside vanished in black darkness, leaving us blind as well. But we could find each other by touch, and made our threesome more exciting too. Magic was nice, but best use it for training as well as pleasure. Firefly Odin finished learning another spell, or better said a battle magic spell. The magic tomes brought by his master did not require a magic wind to cast, but they did get stronger for a wind user. Odin was particularly fascinated with the three auras, resistance, protection and invulnerability. While they weren't as strong as the cheeky names suggested, they did provide an insight into becoming as durable as his master. Same again for the mobility spells, Accelerate Time, Fleet Foot and Flight. There were also spells to increase his strength like Hammerhand or Magical Might, but Odin didn't consider them as important. He would never match a bear in pure strength, not to mention a dragon. And he didn't need to anyways. His amber claws were deadly enough if they could make contact with an enemy. Armor or weapons, skin or bones, they simply parted like rain in front of his special claws. Taking a deep breath, Odin began layering auras and mobility spells then jumped from the Waldenhof's walls and flew like a hawk. For three seconds he felt like a real wizard, strong, fast and durable, flying too. Then his magic reserves reached their end and he fell, amber claws vanishing as well. Little Odin is being reckless again? A curious voice appeared in his mind, as the imperial dragon plucked him in mid-fall before he landed into the haystack at the base of the wall. He might be reckless, not suicidal. What do you want, Jet? Odin growled as the dragon caught speed and flew towards the world's edge mountains faster than a cannonball. Much faster. What do I want? I hunted 97 trolls and blinded them a hundred times each. Just because the warden has a stupid apprentice blind in one eye. Jet growled in annoyance, then landed on a rocky outcrop filled with troll bones. Almost a hundred trolls, going by the skulls. Wait. Lady Rivia said the injury is too old. It can't be healed anymore. Odin exclaimed in a wary voice, but it was too late. A swipe from the dragon's claw gouged out both his eyes, including the good one. Who cares what a human wizard says? I am a dragon. Cure. Jet proclaimed in a confident tone, and light returned into both of Odin's eyes. A strange kind of double vision made Odin wobble with the loss of balance. Jet was covered in a magic glow, like burning metal, while his heart glowed with warm light. You made things worse. I see glowing things now. Odin muttered, although he touched his eye to make sure it was back again. Maybe Master was right. Dragons were bullshit. The dragon examined the young apprentice for a minute. Different, but not worse. You must have gained a form of magic sight, like I have. Now show me those spells, he demanded in a hurried mental voice. Odin sighed and began forming the new spells he just learned. Why would a dragon want to learn weak battle magic? He had no idea. But since he gained his eye back, might as well reward the big dragon with new spells. Jet just waited patiently, and just nodded after each spell. These five spells are the newest ones. I also learned flight, but I don't think you need it. Odin explained while channeling to recover more mana. Show me. If I need it or not, it's not your concern, the imperial dragon demanded in a cold tone. Odin floated a meter in the air, then dropped down into a pile of troll bones. Jet sighed audibly, and muttered something like, a dozen new settings, before grabbing Odin and flying back to the castle at super speed. Slowing down and flying over the training grounds, 
Jet dropped Odin and picked up Thor with his other claw then flew away. I only have one spell. Come back next month. Thor yelled before the dragon just vanished in a crazy burst of speed. A minute later, Thor was dumped back on the ground and the dragon saluted in midair before heading north towards Ostermark. You had a new spell? Which one? Odin asked his intellectually challenged brother. Ah. I learned Wind Blast. It was the only one that worked with my wolf form. Thor explained in a proud voice. Odin clenched his fist and managed not to sigh, or yelled in outrage. He never got the gist of the wind blast, and his brother could use it even while in white wolf form? You should try lightning bolt next. Jet will like it too, he advised his brother as they walked towards the stairs. Thor frowned for a minute, then nodded. You got your eye back, he noted a minute too late. Dragons are bullshit. Odin answered in a calm voice, and his brother smiled widely. Ha ha. They sure are. Maybe Master can catch a few more. Odin wanted to shout and explained it was impossible, but with his Master impossible was merely a matter of punching a bit harder. If he could find half a dozen wives, he may find more dragons too. You should suggest that to him, Thor. I did the rings last time. Odin deflected the problem onto his luckier brother. Truly, the heavens and the gods loved idiots. Master had an excuse, since he would only scratch his head in confusion if a comet struck him down, but Thor would likely destroy an enemy army and also find a precious relic in the crater. And indeed, Thor sniffed the air and poked the wall to the side. Lady Emma? Should I ask Master to find more dragons? He asked in an innocent voice. As expected, Thor learned detect magic simply by associating it with a better sense of smell, and then forgot to turn it off. No wonder the big dragon liked Thor so much. As for Odin, while a bit envious on Thor, he mostly wanted to be like his master. One day, he will fight a dragon too. Hmm. I'm not sure about more dragons, but one more should be alright, the grey mage inside the wall mused out loud, then stepped through a shadow and ruffled Thor's head as if he was a precocious genius. Odin had seen the spell happen, two dimensions superimposed for a second, while Lady Emma traversed the shadows quite a bit different than he imagined it worked. Did she enter a different plane, perhaps the plane of shadows? Did Gur also have its own plane? Maybe Master will know. Soon enough, they sat at the table with all the wizard ladies and Grum appeared too, keeping quiet in a corner. The amber wizard flew through the window and waved at everyone with a cheerful face. My wives, and the rest. Everyone hungry? Grum grunted softly while Thor yelled his agreement. Does Gur have its own plane? Odin asked in a calm voice. Master P.F. smiled a bit too wide. Odin, you gain more wisdom with the new eye. And yes, Gur has its own plane. It's mostly a wasteland, but still has beasts and such. Odin nodded as things became clear. The loss of one eye for years had been worth it then. Now, he could try to enter Gur's plane just like Lady Emma traveled through the plane of shadows. Master, can you find another dragon? For Jed I mean. Thor added with a childish voice. P.F.'s eyes glinted with amusement and then glared at Lady Emma for no reason at all. I could. But what will this new dragon eat? He asked in a joking voice. Odin looked, really looked at his master with his new eye, and found a fountain of amber wind, impossibly bright and infinitely deep. Jet's bright heart was barely a candle compared to a sun. And P.F. always claimed he was a poor wizard. What about his wizard wives? They were pale fireflies, dim and barely aflame at all. It wasn't dragons that were bullshit. P.F. was. Attack on Drakenhof. The preparations for the next advance into Sylvania took more than two years, simply because the intrinsic latency of medieval transportation. Which is basically walking. If you ever walked 1,000 miles, you know how long that takes. On the other hand, thousands of hopeful conscripts and hundreds of impoverished nobles arrived in this time to get a chance to fight in the army of the East and oust the vampires from the Holy Land of the Empire. Some arrived by river boat or by horse, more by wagon and caravan, and most of them on foot. Most of the new recruits arrived starved and in poor physical condition, as expected of people marching through sun and rain for months, 
and sleeping in grass and forest. There must have been others that gave up and got lost, or died during their trek, but I can only count the ones who did arrive. Add to this the recovery period including healing by the wild guard mages, the training phases including gun discipline and then mustering in their camps with new armor and guns to begin live training in the Sylvanian bogs and forests still infested with monsters, mutants, and undead. As an ad hoc solution we used warm air balloons to monitor the forts and nearby lands, which increased the use of spyglasses and telescopes, as did the introduction of snipers and their long rifles. When the Army of the East finally marched on Drakenhof, we numbered over 10,000 soldiers, 50 war wagons and 100 great cannons, plus several mages flying on griffins to provide aerial cover and scouting. It would take a few decades to fully establish an air corps for my wild guard, since both griffins and mages were quite rare. But the basis was already here, and a dozen griffins and their nests were transported from their distant peaks to the welcoming crenellations of Castle Waldenhof. Jet liked playing with the griffin pups, or perhaps train them to be worthy fighters. Maybe both. It involved a lot of flying, hunting, flight and cure spells and tons of screeches. As a dragon, Jet was quite the adherent to my aerial supremacy doctrine. But for now, superior firepower will be sufficient. Soon enough, our cannons opened fire towards the hordes of zombies and skeletons guarding Drakenhof, over a million of them, blowing up thousands of enemies with each salvo. From among the undead troops, dark magicians cast their own spells, returning the zombies to a semblance of combat effectiveness, if not life. But lost limbs and weapons in the bombardment did not return, even with their great necromantic spells, and so our cannons kept firing and blowing up more zombie formations, skeleton archers, and even ghouls and crypt terrors, while more and more advanced units poured out from Drakenhof. I raised my own spyglass and noted Vargulls and Vargeists, Death Guards, and even Black Knights preparing for the counterattack. With a 100 to 1 numerical superiority in so many high tier monsters, the von Karstein vampires probably felt quite secure in repelling our siege. Coming from the side, a squad of nine terrorgeists attempted to induce mass panic into my army, so I took off at hyperspeed and smacked them with my 300 kilo club made of nigh indestructible gromroll. Move, counter move. You're next, dear count. The imperial dragon glanced at me with one eye. What now, warden? We let the guns fire. I didn't bring an entire army just to win single handedly. And you will probably die by yourself, outnumbered a million to one. I answered with a careless shrug. He would surely do a big damage to the undead, but if their high tier units crippled his wings, even a dragon would die. Jet sighed softly and kept silent. As expected, the vampires were not content to just wait and let their army disintegrate under artillery fire. As one, the undead turned our way and began shuffling and try to reach melee range. I glanced down, to find the engineers were hard at work, digging trenches and raising stake fences, while the war wagons were towed into their positions, with the front road wheels parked on the planks set over roller logs. A primitive aiming assist, since we lacked both tracks and turrets. Even trunions for the cannons inside, which allowed a modicum of elevation control were a big discovery in this day and age. Firewall, front ranks. Delay the undead for a few minutes. I told my dragon and he dived to attack. Our fortifications were not complete, which could lead to an early penetration of our lines. It wouldn't do for my reputation. The battle magic spell was properly called Wall of Fire, not the Firewall of Bright Wizards, since it wasn't a magic wind spell. But give this spell to a dragon, have it fueled by dragon fire, and then extrapolate it to a dozen settings. The entire front line burned, as Jet burst this flames into long lines of dragon fire, which then extended with walls of fire left and right. In a minute, the dragon returned at my side, breathing in deep as he channeled magic back into his core. I wondered for a second how it would feel to be out of mana, but then shrugged. It would never happen. Roland and Gisela added their own fire spells to the dragon's wall, burning thousands more zombies as they marched into the flames and just burned to ash. Elevation 15. Fuses at 1.3 seconds, the cannon captains shouted to their crew, as other crew rushed with wet plunges to clean the barrels for the next shot. The next salvo of bombs landed among the Black Knights, just as they formed for a charge. I glanced down to find Janna, the celestial wizard congratulate the cannon commander for an effective salvo. 
Whatever scrying or precogition spell was specific to celestial wizards, it sure worked nicely to provide targeting coordinates for my artillery. To me celestial magic looked like astrology and reading the future in tea leaves, but if that kind of magic actually worked and provided effective battlefield support, it was welcome. Of course, the vampires had their own casters and mages, much older and greater than our own. Summon zombies emerged past the flame wall, while curses and fear spells stuck the front ranks. Alana and Rivia tried their best to counter, but they were overmatched by thousands of years old liches and dark mages. Dispel. I chanted in a loud voice, and the battlefield lost its magic luster for a second. The firewalls and the curses vanished both, leaving only small bonfires of dragonfire still devouring dead zombies. A surprised silence covered the entire field, followed soon after by the cheers of my army and the sound of guns. Lord Warden. Sigmar. For the Empire. Steady shot. Aim for the heads. Despite our gunners shooting the zombies with deadly efficiency, the undead had huge numbers and kept advancing. Right in the sights of our war wagons. Their cannons were loaded with grapeshot, and their salvo cleaned the front ranks of zombies for 20 meters inward. I'll land and cleanse, Jet said curtly, and drop just in the back of the war wagons, possibly wary of friendly fire, which is not too friendly to anything not invulnerable. Then his body began to glow with the light of HYSH, drawing Alana into his spell as a pillar of light split the heavy cloud cover, even filling my own heart with the same light. I smiled and cast Detect Magic instead, making use of the ease of the spell. My own troops and their rune weapons gained a tinge of yellow while in the vampire camp, 21 vampires and magicians lit up with black lights covering their magic items. So I drew my amber bow and began shooting. One by one, my arrow of time traversed the battlefield to strike the heart of each enemy, then returned to my hand to be loosed again. I patted myself on the back, mentally, for being so smart. Then a giant cloud of bats flew towards us and coalesced mid-flight into a large and old vampire wearing red armor. The cleanse spell of my dragon evaporated thousands of zombies and skeletons every second, but this vampire seemed unaffected. Congratulations mortals! You managed to awaken me ahead of time with your light show. But, now I am very thirsty. The old monster growled, and I could feel his hunger driving him. I landed in front of the vampire count, and lifted my club on my shoulder. Did you wash your neck vampire, before coming here to die? I asked in my coolest voice. His eyes glared red, almost driving me to my knees. You court death, mortal. For I am Vlad von Karstein, Elector Count of Sylvania and the true Emperor of the Empire. I nodded gently. Technically, the Vampire Count was correct, as he rubbed elbows with Sigmar back in the day. Over 2,400 years ago. So you're saying, the man who kills you gets your stuff? I asked in a curious voice, while glancing at his magic ring which granted him immortality. Then I moved. Accusation. My hand grabbed and crushed the vampire's ring hand, holding him in place as my club crashed into his right knee, producing a sickening crunch noise. An emperor you say? That only feeds on humans? I asked rhetorically, as my club raised again to smack the count in the shoulder before he could hit me with a black sword. Fool, he growled, not really discouraged by the pain. The vampire had died a few times before, and was probably hoping to do so again. Let's see then. Sedition, treason, armed rebellion at the first glance. Then necromancy and using warpstone to fuel your magic. How do you plead, Elector Count? I continued my public interrogation, while my club blew up his other knee. Why would I care for those stupid mortal laws? Vlad countered in a disgusted tone. Exactly. The empire of man is a construct of laws. What would Sigmar say, if he saw you right now? Good job, my dear Count? I wondered in a mocking voice, while hanging my club and grabbing the vampire by the spine. Vlad von Karstein recoiled at my words, his red eyes glaring inward for a second. Sigmar. He muttered in a daze. I can tell you what Sigmar will say. I whispered in his ear, while my arrow of time stabbed the vampire Count in his heart. But why spoil the surprise? You're about to hear his words soon. Farewell, Elector Count. 
I continued while slipping his immortality ring on my own finger. Whatever words the vampire tried to say crumbled into dust along with his body. I picked a black pendant from the air, before it fell among the rest of armor and weapons that piled at my feet. Asterisk congratulations. You have obtained the Karstein immortality ring. Upon death the wearer will return to life at sundown. You have obtained a lichbone pendant. Grants 30% resistance to spells and magic weapons. Your Warden of the East rank now covers Sylvania as well, granting plus 5 corruption reduction and plus 5 control per year. I stared for a second at the game menu, then sighed inward. Bombs from our cannons fell among the shambling zombies, blowing up thousands more, but this time there was no necromancer around to reform them. I grabbed the loot and flew to the back line, and began aiding with the supplies, unloading carts of ammo at hyperspeed. The giant undead army will take a long time to be vanquished, and more ammo will help. The dragon was still channeling his cleansing funnel, making the dark clouds spin around the horizon like hurricane. At least the sky was clear now. Sometime later, I felt Emma sneak back and then uncloak beside me, while I lazed around with my wild guard scouts and hunters. Lord Warden, Castle Drakenhof is still warded and protected, at least four maybe five high-ranked vampires or dark wizards, she reported and sat down tired her mana almost spent from using too much grey magic. I nodded and stood up. Our mages were all tired and low of mana, while the gunners were starting to miss even easy shots due to prolonged combat, as holding 5 kilos of rifle up wasn't easy for a normal human, especially after a few hours. Spears, take the front for an hour. I ordered in a clear voice, while pointing at my snipers to flank and help a little while the gunners rested. I'll go out as well, Jet sent to my mind, as he leaped over the front lines and started his disco ball spell that spun metal balls around like a constant cannonball barrage. His claws blurred as well, slamming through a dozen zombies and skeletons at once. I stretched my shoulders and picked up the unbreakable. I'll go after the big monsters now. I explained politely, and my hunters just nodded gravely. I chose the most direct route, crushing through the middle of the undead army and leaving only clouds of blood and bone dust in my wake. Then I kicked the largest Varagulf I ever seen in the chin, and while his head evaporated I began smacking the Death Guard and other mutated monsters into blood paint. Damn stupid vampires! They had so many advantages, they could have laid waste to orcs or skaven with ease, but no. Why not go after humanity? Oh well. I was here to encourage a perspective change for those who would attack the Empire, and later the humanity in general. Speak softly and carry a big stick, you'll go far. A smart president said once. My stick should be big enough, right? What do you say, is my stick big enough? I asked curious, in a soft voice, as a whole pack of Vargulfs rushed towards me howling for blood. What would take an army to bring down, took me a dozen swipes with my big runic club. Best idea I ever had, this club. Quite the way to bring out the caveman hidden inside me. Smack, smack. Eventually Jet made his way to the back of the undead army too, and fired his jets of dragonfire over the piles of crushed meat and bone that had risen a few stories high. Good job, Jet. I praised the imperial dragon, who had a thousand arrows and dozens of spears stuck into his runic armor, plus several gashes and cuts into his wings. In comparison, the armor that Doran the runesmith made for me was covered in blood and acid, but not a single weapon had touched it. I felt more like stomping ants and getting splashed with their insides. I am getting tired, Warden. Why are so many undead here? Jet asked with an exhausted tone. Why not? The dead outnumbered the living at least 100 to 1, plus numerous manufactured and mutated monsters. A charge of black knights got splattered by Jet's metal balls, but the fallen knights just stood back up and charged again until they met my club and vanished into bone dust. Go back and heal, Jet. I can do this all day. For a million years. I advised the poor dragon who seemed on his last legs. Damn monster. The dragon muttered with a sad voice and began walking back towards our lines, leaving broken bones and a trail of blood after him. Bombs fell all around me, and even on top of me, but I just ignored them. They barely scraped the blood and acid away from my armor, not that it would last. There were plenty undead to destroy, and I didn't want the battle to last after sundown. 
Darkness would only favor the dead, even if firewalls and light spells could still provide some combat ability for the army, it would not be full effectiveness. After smashing the nine regiments of death guards, I chased the flying bargeists before they landed among our cannons, filling the air above the army with a blood rain left by exploding mutated vampires. Not ideal, but war never is. I'll try to cleanse the army before they get corrupted. Jet spoke in my mind as I returned to push back the front lines of undead, then changed course and started helping the cavalry before they got overrun by zombie wolves and howling ghouls. Perhaps a bit too late. I could see at least two dozen dead cavalrymen, and more wounded horses limping away towards the forest. Monstrous regiment, ox stands, hunter's moons, and cure wounds spells recovered the cavalry to a semblance of cohesion and combat power. Thus I decided to chance it, and cast Tall's fury onto the cavalry. It was a bit much, as my men became berserk and ripped the poor dire wolves to shreds, before changing direction and closing with the remaining zombies and ghouls, and gored them as well. The horses were even worse, biting and kicking like wild beasts, their eyes filled with bestial fury. Horses should eat grass or hay, not zombie heads. I might have overdone it a little. Rats. One might think our victory at Drakenhof changed things for the better, and in some ways it did. The major threat of a vampiric army striking in force was eliminated, but Sylvania was still infested with undead and dark wizards. The local population, the few living Sylvanians peasants were mostly starving and had to be relocated north, while the army advanced slowly and methodically, shooting and slicing feral zombies and ghouls. Our wizards and priests had the grueling task of consecrating the foul sorcery sites, not an easy task since they were all at odds. The Sigmarite warrior priests might be a boon on the battlefield with their faith powers, but in a civilian capacity they were simply rabid fanatics. And don't let them hear about Skaven. There are no such things as the Skaven. Superstition and child tales an old priest claimed with furious eyes, his hand clenched on the hammer icon hanging on his chest. I just shrugged politely. Perhaps the name itself strikes a chord. I meant the rat dens under major cities, or even dwarf holds. Big rats though, going from dog size to ogre size. Some of them even use magic fueled by warp stone. I explained in a mild voice. I had no need to aggravate the Sigmar's priesthood, nor would it serve any good purpose. The priest glared at me with intent. Rats. Pretty much, yes. But that's like calling a vampire a bat. These rats are holding thousands of people in slavery and always kidnap more. They even have pirate ships out in the ocean. And powerful magic too. I continued with a kind smile. We would know of such things, if they existed. Another warrior priest interjected, his voice suspicious and incredulous. I looked at the holy templars and fancy armors who stared at me like I was a fake prophet. Of course you would, if you would not burn alive the witnesses when they dare to come forth. What did your top guy say? Superstition, right? The grand theogonist, the warrior priest muttered in a slow voice. That was kind of the Pope of the Sigmar's cult, and infallible of course. Like any man should be. Right. Whatever title you gave your top guy. Look, you already know of beastmen. You've seen the Vargeists and crypt terrors made by vampires. It's exactly the same thing, mutation and corruption caused by warpstone. Only mostly underground for these rats. They are sneaky, and bide their time. I concluded with a deep sigh. Hesitant glances among the priests gave me a bit of hope. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, Warden of the East. Your strength is not in doubt, but your feats in battle do not make you able to change our religious doctrine. I nodded while seeing the problem. I do not wish to change your doctrine. It's perfectly fine as it is, and binds the empire of man together, much like my roads do. But warpstone mutation affects all living and unliving things, thus your doctrine must expand to address this reality. Including bats and rats. The lead priest shook his bald head, unconvinced. We will need a stronger proof, Lord Warden. These dens. Of course, I did tell you the rats are digging under most cities. But the largest den I know is right under Altdorf. We can be there in a few minutes and see the proof with your own eyes. I said with a gleaming smile. 
Altdorf stands astride the confluence of the rivers Rake and Talabek, which makes the city a hub for ships going down the river to the ocean. Under the city, the rats had built a whole network of tunnels and even directed underground rivers to carry their barges of trade and slaves. Luckily for the empire, the Skaven warprail trains did not reach Altdorf, which meant reinforcements from various rat clans would need to take the foot tunnels from Nuln. Unluckily for the empire, once I collapsed the major tunnel towards Nuln, the Skaven had either the choice of sitting still and getting massacred, or coming out through their myriad of small tunnels and burrows towards the surface. On the other hand, Altdorf did hold the largest imperial garrison, plus the home fleet base, plus the Colleges of Magic and the Holy Temple of Sigmar. While I was underground, dealing with the far more dangerous Grey Seers, and other warpstone mutants and magic war machines powered by more warpstone, the city above was engulfed in flames and warfare between men and rats. Altdorf itself held the highest population in the empire, over one million people, with about 10% of those people living underground in various caves, dwarf tunnels and basements, and often trading with the Skaven for illegal and heretical magic and devices. I think most of these people died, either to the Skaven themselves rushing out, or to the imperial counterattack which followed, lead by fanatical Sigmarite priests, witch hunters and various battle wizards supported by imperial troops. It could have been far worse, and would have been in the future. But like this, the boil was lanced early and the empire had another enemy to deal with. The new emperor wasn't too happy with the Skaven attack, and neither was the grand theogonist of Sigmar's cult, who was kinda pissed at having his doctrine proven a bit incorrect. Newton's rats sounded completely different from Skaven, after all. And now, we also have to deal with the rat dens under Middelheim, Talabium and Marienburg, before turning our might towards Nuln and clearing the tunnels going into the Grey Mountains. I spoke in front of the War Council, which included representatives of the largest powers in the Empire. Wizards, Inquisitors and warrior priests glared at me as if I was the one guilty of this state of affairs. I just smiled and glanced around the room, taking notes of each reluctant face. This will cost my empire a great deal, Lord Warden. For province capitals might get ravaged by the rats too, if we proceed in this way, the emperor spoke with a tired voice. Of course, we can also hide our heads in the sand, and proclaim the Skaven do not exist. Sorry, I mean rats. Or even that this war never happened and everything is just fine. I proposed with a kind voice. The Grand Theogonist seemed ready to agree with the stupid solution too, nodding wisely. If His Majesty would agree to grant me the Warden of the South rank, my Gold Order and I will make sure to turn these rats into lead. Or maybe Gold the Magister Patriarch of the Gold Order proposed with a honeyed voice. A hundred angry eyes turned on Baltazar Gelt, but the man's greedy face was hidden under his gold mask, and he seemed undisturbed, maybe even glad at the attention. I sighed inward and continued my crowd scan, until a light wizard smiling in agreement with Gelt's proposal stood out like a beacon in my mind. Curious behavior for a light wizard who was supposed to hate gold wizards. This reminded me of another guy with a dragon. Chaos guy with a chaos dragon. I just flew at his side and grabbed his neck before anyone could react. Who is this person? I asked the light order's patriarch. He is Egrim Van Horstman, my best student and our future patriarch, the old wizard spoke in a worried voice, already glowing with HYSH winds. While my wrist rotated sharply to snap the guy's neck, I ripped the light wizard's robes off, showing a body tattooed with chaos symbols. Banishment now, if you can. I asked in a low voice, while my other hand summoned an arrow of time to stab the chaos cultist in the heart. Two dozen spells from the gathered wizard struck the dead body just as a powerful demon burst through the reality veil and was hooked by my time arrow and held in place. At least half of those spells struck me as well, but they didn't affect me too much. I had already 70% magic resistance from artifacts, plus my natural immunity. I felt Gelt arrive at speed and smash a gold spell fist into the demon, just as the Light Order's patriarch managed to cast his banishment. Two top-tier wizards, plus myself, and the demon still forced its way through, causing panic inside the council's room until the Grand Theogonist jumped in with his holy hammer and crushed the demon. Curse you, foolish mortals, the demon screeched, making several people faint with their ears bleeding. A soft sigh emerged behind me, and my teacher extended his amber spear to impale the demon, and held it still while silver bullets and more glowing spells, magic hammers and containment arrays converged on the demon, as dwarf runes it up on the room's walls. Still not enough. 
But with Gregor Martak's spell so close, and the clear and present danger of an emerging demon, my magic just aligned and the arrow of time changed into a spear. Asterisk congratulations. You have mastered the amber spear spell. You gain plus 5 gur affinity. My spell broke the stalemate, shattering the demon into warp bits and closing the portal. I'm too old for this bullshit. P.F., you can deal with this city business. Martak muttered and walked away, leaving the council room in a few small steps that bent time somehow, such that his words could be heard while he was already flying away on Twin Shriek's back. As you say, teacher. I answered in a gentle tone. Maybe one day I could be as cool as he, a mysterious wizard moving as he pleased. Gelt's mask turned to stare after Martak, but most others didn't even see my teacher come and go. Your future light patriarch, right? Curious choice. Baltzer Gelt said in a less amused voice, then nodded towards me and returned to his chair like nothing has happened. I followed suit, treating this matter like it never happened. The emperor just pointed at the light patriarch, silent in his rage. The priests of Sigmar will be glad to assist the light order with tracing the actions of this traitor, the Grand Theogonist spoke with a heavy voice, daring anyone to oppose him. The emperor just nodded, then raised a hand. Do confine this event to secrecy, everyone. This never happened, understood, he demanded in his imperial voice. I flew beside Gelt and handed him the runic axe I had found earlier. You will make a great warden for the South, Gold Patriarch. I expect to the see you in Nuln, in three months. I said in a respectful voice, then flew up before Jet got too anxious and crashed into the room. I could have cleansed that demon by myself. Jet claimed in a proud voice as we flew towards Mindelheim. I thought for a minute, then nodded. My dragon's light was powerful enough, that was true. Stronger than any wizard I knew, even the Light Order's patriarch. One demon, yes. But you think too small, little Jet. A million demons, and several great demons too. You need to grow stronger. Jet glared at me, then pushed his time warp spell higher, reaching a new setting. Around Mach 15, going by the mile effort I had to put in catching up. A 50% speed increase from Mach 10 was not bad at all. Still not fast enough? Jet asked with surprise. He was quite fast, but I was faster. Try twice this speed for your next setting. Don't think so small. I advised my dragon with a careless voice. An angry growl was my only answer. Hound. The reward for clearing the tunnels under Middleheim of Skaven rats and other criminals was its own reward, but the local wizard guild bestowed me with three weeks of intense lessons from their magister. Three weeks meant I could learn the basics of three new battle spells, the most important being Accelerate Time, which didn't do that, but granted me a 50% speed boost. Or I could cast it on someone else too, as a buff. Regular people gained 100% speed boost, but they were also much slower anyway so it was kind of fair. The next spell was called Blast, which also didn't blast anything, instead shooting a stream of magic missiles that could be spread out to strike a group, or a single target. Using an entire week to train only this spell in the middle mountains reduced the local monsters and beastmen by half, since my mana didn't exactly drain, or perhaps regenerated much faster that I could spend it. Either way, the incursion in the mountains provoked a black dragon to come and chase me, which didn't go as well as I thought. Perhaps Jet wasn't the best example of a dragon, but this black one was nigh immune to magic and could spit streams of corrosive acid just like a zombie dragon. He wasn't immune to the unbreakable club, but my club wasn't immune either. Its perfect baseball bat shape now changed into a gnarly mess of metal. At least it didn't break. Finally, the last spell was called Conjure Servitor, which also didn't summon a nice butler from another plane of existence. Instead, it allowed me to animate a bunch of wood, ropes, and metal bits and make it into a golem, which wasn't strong at all. I mean, it was stronger than a human, but that wasn't saying much. I'll need to speak with my runesmith friend and try to obtain some better materials for a nicer golem. Instead, my imperial dragon learned a single spell here, called Drain Magic which did exactly what the name did, and more. Not only did it suck the magic about someone, but it also added it do himself. So unfair. 
Anyways, we then followed the rat tunnel down south to Taildheim and massacred the rats and their magical seers much easier, since we caught them by surprise, and Jed was quite useful now, even draining a grey seer by himself. Turns out, without mana a grey seer is just a weak rat that was a mere snack for my dragon. The huge rats tunnels linking the provincial capitals gave me an idea for later, since they could be used as bomb shelters, warehouses, and even metro lines once enough steam trains could be obtained. Much easier to secure too, without the threat of monsters breaking the train lines and derailing our trains. There would also be room for normal roads and perhaps underground rivers being converted into channels for trade boats. In Marienburg, things got worse, since the Skaven were alerted and rushed out into the streets and channels of the city, causing a fierce fight with the militia and the imperial garrison. However, the navy was also prepared and armed with guns and cannons, and the channels allowed the ships to navigate from battle to battle like huge tanks. Once the rat caverns were cleared, the city received a huge boon, since the population now had a place to expand, from housing to warehouses and even shops and some industries that didn't require fire, like textiles, and so on. More work for me, clearing out warpstone and other toxic sludge left by the rats, but with my speed boost I finished cleaning up just in time to reach Nuln and the Gold Order's armies prepared here under Baltzergelt. Warden of the South, I said in a polite voice. The Golden Mask nodded at me. Warden of the East, and Jet Golden Weave. A pleasure to meet the Imperial Dragon, the Gold Patriarch answered in a strange voice, while his mask stared at my dragon for too long. Hmm. Make him a nicer robe, Jet. Painted silk is not enough for the Warden of the South. I urged my dragon with a friendly elbow to his ribs. They didn't break, so he should be fine. Jet rubbed his ribs while casting cure wounds on himself, then raised a claw and produced another wonderful miracle for the gold wizard. Then my dragon froze for a second, and focused his gaze at another gold wizard waiting in the ranks. Warden, that man. I moved and grabbed the target by his neck, just as the fallen wizard revealed his chaos magic and summoned a three-headed dog demon. Too late, mortals, Lord Karanak will feast on your bones, the chaos cultist yelled and then died as I snapped his spine. Even with my speed, I was still too slow. Not again I heard Geld mutter in a sad voice. Jet blurred into battle, smashing the demon hound with his claw and launching it into the air, while growling at me, let me deal with this demon. I stepped back beside Gelt and watched the air battle with interest. My dragon was armored and warded, and using his drain to power up powerful molten claws that ripped through the screaming demon. I hoped the dead guy wasn't the next gold patriarch. I whispered with a bit of irony. Who? Ah, Rickett Drawborg was not that good. Not even a magister after 100 years in the order. Gelt answered after a second. Too bad then. I'll dive into the caverns now. I spoke with a careless glance at the imperial dragon, and then pushed down straight through the plaza and the bedrock. To be fair, normal rock was just as easy to move through as water for me, barely slowing me down as I drilled through and emerged into the giant caverns below. Blast! 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 A thousand spells later, most of the Skaven were dead and burning, leaving only their mages and the warp constructs to deal with. A grey seer emerged behind me from a shadow and tried to stab me with an oily dagger, but I was in accelerated time now, and circled his paw with my Aikido move, then returned the dagger into his neck. For a second, the seer glared at me with hate, then melted into a puddle of acid and poison. Ah, uh, nasty stuff on that dagger. Another rat mage pointed an emerald glowing staff at me, so I threw the same dagger into his belly. He also melted. A dozen warp cannons fired their beams at me, but I was already flying away. Damn Skaven! Train! You can say anything bad about the Gold Order and you're not going to be wrong. They are arrogant and annoying, obtuse and secretive, sometimes treacherous other times magnanimous, deadly to their enemies and great friends to have. Because they are rich. An entire magic order with more money than common sense, 
as proven by the dead guy who summoned a demon earlier. Imagine you lived in our current world, and your superpower was manipulating the digital to create bitcoins at will. Although magical gold is forbidden for buying goods and services, the gold order has mastery over a lot more metals than mere gold. Plus, imperial law is only enforced inside the empire borders. A clever gold wizard can always buy things with magic gold from distant lands, such as Estalia, Tilia, or even Araby. And while magical gold will revert itself to lead after a while, the gold order is still very rich. So rich they can hire thousands of mercenaries from Kislev and Tilia to fight for them, and they can also repair and improve the weapons and armor of said mercenaries with enchantments and various transmutation feats. Which is quite nice for me, as the various regiments of renown descend into the Skaven caverns and help me clear out the enemy. And then loot the corpses. This is not so great, as bits of warpstone are always integrated with Skaven equipment and thus are deadly to touch, for mutation and curses and other worse reasons touching the soul of a mundane human. Even mages and wizards are quite in danger from warpstone, which is why the material is forbidden in the Empire of Man. While dragging a leather sack filled with warpstone bits, I met Balthazar Gelt once more. His new runic axe is dripping with green rat blood. Warden, found anything nice down here? I ask in a pleasant voice. His golden mask measures me for a long moment. Hundreds of cannons stolen from Nuln and thousands of slaves. Enough to begin creating my army of the South, he answers in a secretive tone. I smile a bit sad. It is a power play. But it doesn't really matter for the next 50 years. The Imperial Dragon uses both light and gold magic. And these demons target both of your orders equally. I say with a cryptic voice and fly away. As I return for the next cleanup a minute later, Gelt is waiting by the pile of warpstones I collected from the rats. Maybe he got the point? Are you suggesting cross-training, Warden of the East? The Gold Magister wonders while I fill the sack again. I nod gently. For now, I suggest you retrain all your wizards to cast the battle spells available at Middleheim. The winds of magic can be melded in numerous ways, but Teclis did have a working method to reduce the dangers. His mask changes color from gold to silver as I fly away loaded with more warpstone to throw into space. I think I made my point now. While the tunnels under Nuln go for a thousand miles under the Grey Mountains, the Gold Order and their mercenaries should be sufficient. Plus the future army of the South and their cannons. The Skaven will keep trying, and the army of the South will get plenty of battle experience in these tunnels. As for myself, I have two goals to achieve. One, as suggested by Emma and Janna, is to roam the seas and the ocean to the west for pirates and treasure. The possible loot of this operation would allow me to provide for the next goal. Securing the East by strengthening Kislev. I can also recruit some mercenaries for my wild guard, mostly as combat trainers and other cadres like recruiting, supply and logistics. The army of the East is too powerful and important to move outside the empire, plus they are still needed in Sylvania for a decade or three. Pacifying the undead infested lands is the work of a generation, and we'll probably never find all the caves and hideouts hiding the last undead. Anyways, it takes another week to clean up the undercity caverns of Nulm, until I can fly to Zuffbar and trade with a famous runesmith once more. However the corpse of a black dragon and a dozen tons of Gromrel minerals are sufficient to buy me some rare dwarf goodwill. I only read about dragons until I met you, Warden. But now I can work with dragon scales and bones. I am certain I will create marvelous items from them, the runesmith proclaims in an ecstatic voice. So I drop my mangled club on the ground with a loud clang. His face changes a dozen colors at the sight, then he eyes the battered dragon corpse. Perhaps using a dragon bone into the alloy will increase the durability of weapon. He mutters in dismay. Perhaps. I do need 1,000 long rifles with glass optics for my wild guard. And a set of runic light armor for them as well. Enough bullets to fight a dozen beastmen warherds, and some dwarf volunteers if any want to join. I hear Kislev is filled with all kind of monsters. I speak very softly. My big stick is mangled but present too. The runesmith glances at his fellow dwarves in his group. You mean slayers. He says in a doubtful tone. His bodyguards grunt with stern faces. 
We leave in a year, as I still need to clean up the last vampires in Sylvania and open a trade route through the mountains. I explain in a polite voice. Although managing the Sylvanian castles won't take more than a month, I do need to find and loot a lot of pirates. One year of pirate raiding should be enough to fill my treasury. The guns will be ready by next year, Warden of the East. And I'll pay for the silver bullets myself the runesmith offers with a sad voice. The Dottie must have begun mass-producing my steel rifles then, if my royalties have reached 100,000 silver. I take out the schematics for a steam train, modified to include oil sprinklers for extra heat in the steam chamber, plus conical wheels to keep the train on track and a revolver cannon for the turret. And I don't mean a multi-barrel cannon like the dwarves already have, but a rotating chamber like a revolver pistol. I did consider heat enchantments for the iron brakes, but I left those out for now, since iron is quite cheap. If you produce 10 steam locomotives in a decade, I will pay 100,000 gold for them. While the runesmith ponders over the detailed schematics of the train, I fly up and away, reaching my family at Castle Waldenhof in a single minute. Mach 45 speed is quite fast, if I say so myself. I could reach Cathay or IND and be back in a single hour. And I will, one day. But not today. My wives must miss me dearly after months of campaign against the Skaven. Damn those stupid rats, 